We started this year looking at Acts, and uh, it's been an incredible experience of revisiting the origins, which is why we've called it that. We got to the end of chapter 4, and we said, you know what, we've rushed through the high Holy Spirit moments. Let's pause for a moment, and let's find every place in the four chapters where the Holy Spirit is mentioned, fully aware that for some of you, that's a brand new reality. You are very unfamiliar with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you grew up in either no church or you grew up in a church where it was kind of Father, Son, and the Bible. They were the three things that were honored and revered. And there is this exquisite adventure of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. So we, we went back and for eight weeks, nine weeks, we just hung around Him. And it was extraordinary. I don't know about you, but I loved it. Last uh, Sunday night, Olivia came up to me. First time ever, she was shaking. And she said, Chris, a lot last Sunday night, Sunday before, uh, before Easter. And she was shaking. She said, I think I have something. I, I, I feel like God's put something in my heart. She spoke out that someone, a couple had uh, either had a miscarriage or struggled to have a baby and that God wanted to, to touch her womb and she was shaking as she walked back to our seat. A couple instantly popped up, went across and she ministered to them. Powerful little God moments that when we give God the Holy Spirit room, He does extraordinary things. So let's read this passage together. From verse 10 is what I put on the screen. I hope you can read it. I hope the print's big enough. It's from the NIV. There we go. At that moment, she fell down at His feet and died. That's a great verse to start with, isn't it? I wanted to go there, my love. And then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these things. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, People brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Isn't that a magnificent passage? All right, take a seat, folks. Can someone let me their watch? Mine broke. I put it on, and, and normally there's a watch going up there, but it... Oh, Thanks. Can I read it? Is it big enough? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Are you getting me my glasses? No, thanks. <laughs> Easy, Tiger. <laughs> do, do you feel the rhythm of the story? Let's remember, this is not a book of a philosophy or ideas Primarily, it's the story, a stuttering, stumbling story of a group of young believers like we are finding their way forward. It's a moment of great uncertainty. On the one hand, there's fear, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Thanks, baby. On the one hand, there's fear, and on the other hand, there is the sense of anticipation. What on earth is happening next? And can I remind us, they had no Bible to turn to, to say, well, what, what, where can we read about that? They had the Torah, they had the, the original Jewish scriptures, but there was a whole lot of stuff going on in which they had to move in the dark. And I say that because sometimes we feel that, don't we? We feel a little, it's, it's overwhelming, there's too much going on, there's too much information, I, I don't quite get it all. And you're really just being introduced to the world of the first Christians, who themselves had no real format. They had to discover government. They had to discover the gifts. They had to discover community. They had to discover rights and wrongs within the grace of God that we activate by faith. And I love the rhythm of this passage. There's fear, and the fear leads to the whole church being startled and stunned, and I'll comment on that in a moment. And then while that's happening, while they're overwhelmed by two of their people have just died because they lied. Anyone not lied this week? That means the rest of us will die. Isn't that crazy? They lied. They told a half truth. And as a result of that, God took them out. And I hope to give a little insight into that in a moment. So while they're breathless, they're asking questions. They're going to the apostles. What just happened? What, what went down? I mean, two people have just died in front of us. And now what do we do? And while there's all this chaos and confusion and uncertainty, God starts healing, well, heals 
many people. There are many signs and wonders. So do you hear the drag effect of the heart that two people have just died? Then the energized effect of people getting healed and there's signs and wonders and miracles happening everywhere. And then there's the, the people around them saying, the people at the pubs, gun well, and want to say, oh, hang. I'm not hanging with those dudes, man. That is scary stuff. But curiosity gets them to peep around the corner through the curtain to see, actually, what's going on there? We're hearing a whole lot of stuff going on. In fact, it becomes so compelling and they're so desperate. Remember, they had no covered California, no, no Obamacare. Think about it. Meryl would have died at our first baby's birth. Medicine kept her alive. Where did they turn? Not the wealthy, the affluent, the influential. Where would the average person turn? Desperate, hungry, curious, thirsty. Do you feel the rhythm of the, of the story as it unfolds? Crowds come. Have you heard? There was a man, do you remember, did you ever hear of Pastor Dumi, Stan? Just an incredible brother, man. I never met him, I was such an idiot. He was uh, kind of in the greater Durban area when I was there. And I'm told that people used to line up, used to set times in the weaker side and just sit at home and the sick would come. And he would pray for them. And the, the, the extent to which people were healed, I'm told, was dramatic. And what was amazing to me about Pastor Dumi is that he would suddenly stop and there'd be people saying, I've driven four hours to get you. And he said, no, the presence of God is lifted. I can pray, but it'll just be empty breath. Just be empty breath. Be my, my words. My words don't do anything. And he would go inside. I mean, people that desperate to encounter God, the hunger and the thirst that goes with it. So let's just unpack it a little bit. And I, and I really promise I will not be long. I've got, a, I've got Ben's watch, which is on steroids, just like he is. He's like Tigger. He bends, bounces around. <laughs> and then I've got Dana's phone shouting at me. So... I'm cornered. Great fear came upon them. As I mentioned, what happened in the passage ahead was this very theologically curious moment. Two people, tell, a husband and wife, tell a half-truth. And the half-truth is really that they said they sold a property and wanted to be generous like everyone else. And so they lied about how much they actually gave. We covered it a few weeks ago, so I won't do it again. But what does that word fear mean? Sometimes our English does not do justice to a word like that. And so if you've had a father who beat you up, the idea that God is father and that I'm to fear him will drive you into ever increasing distance from him. I can't come near him. It's too scary. I'm, I'm too nervous. What will happen? What will God do to me? I know what my dad did to me. And so the best way we can interpret a complicated word like that is to look at word clusters. Then let's find other words that seem to be attached to them, almost like these grapes. And maybe that will help us understand. And what we do know is with those word clusters, in this case, there is a sense of awe. I don't know if you've ever been in a God moment. It could be in the quiet of your bed and your, your home, or it could be in a, a table community or a prayer time, but you feel like you can't move. You feel breathless. God is here and you're almost too nervous to do anything. I've had a few of those in my life legitimately. You know, honestly, I'm a no BS guy when it comes to the Holy Spirit. I don't like subcultures that, that force things, that make it sound like, whoa, God is really here. I, I, don't, I don't do that. But, but I do know the awe with which I had that moment of breathlessness, just like, wow, God is here. Like, I, I can't move. And when you're leading a meeting, as I often do, you just think, I actually have no idea what I'm supposed to do right now. God is here, and I'm too nervous, but not because I fear him in a horrible, my dad will beat me up kind of way. But because the word cluster goes on, according to Robert Shrimp, reverence and honor and worship and adoration, beautiful clusters of words, Pope Francis said, and I thought I'd throw a little catholic -y thing in here, um, awareness of God's grandeur, a grateful realization that only in Him do we find peace. Or 
As Ray Comfort said, when we don't fear God, when they don't fear God, they give themselves over to evil. Now let me help you understand this for a moment. As I've pondered on this story, why did God do it then? A, why did he do it at all? Why did he do it then? Why didn't he do it later? And it was almost as if he was sending out a message to us that before there is an evidence of power, there is always the demand of pruning. God, dear friends, loves pure water. You gossips, very, very muddy waters. Very muddy waters. It's not good. It's not good. And so what God does with those who lie, who speak ill, who gossip, who do anything that muddy the waters, tell half-truths, God views that with the highest displeasure. And what's interesting to me in the, in the 40 years that we've led is how often there is a time of pruning before there is an outpouring of power. Just a very interesting thing. And people will leave community like ours. And of course, there's plenty of reasons to leave us. We, we're a very imperfected bunch. But I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit starts leaking holiness, purity, truth in amongst us. He starts dripping it in like honey. And people start getting uncomfortable because I want to sleep with my girlfriend. Because I want to have that dishonest deal. Because I want to gossip. Because I want to, I want to, I want to. And slowly but surely, the nurturing pruning of God the Holy Spirit starts knifing away. And eventually they will leave the community. And of course, I've never heard anyone leave a community saying it's my fault. I was a narcissistic rebel. Oh, I'm actually a sinner. I, I like sinning. I want to sin. I want to get drunk on Saturday nights. I want to smoke dope. I want to take meth. I, I want to do all that stuff. So you know what? No one ever says that. Oh, no, no, they, they, they too hard. They, that's, that's, that's too. People were really nervous about joining this community. And that meant they weren't preaching a super cool, sexy seeker message. You want to follow Jesus? It'll cost you everything. Everything. You marry whom he sends you. You work in the space and place where he calls you. You live another life. Now we have the benefit of doing it since we were kids. And I would say amen, 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 over and over and over again. But before there is power, there is pruning 100%. And that's why you start feeling uncomfortable. And you begin to distance yourself from community and distance yourself from worship and anything that brings about awe reverence, honor, worship, and adoration. Are you with me? Is God touching some of your hearts? I hope so. Rock Harbor back in the day in the 90s when they were bouncing, I mean the 500 of them started, it's hardly a church plant, but they were running I think at eight meetings then and thousands of people and they would have every periodic, I think every two to three months they would have what they call Purge Sunday. Purge Sunday. Because it was a super sexy church. And so Mike Erie would get up, Todd would lead the worship, and Mike Erie would get up and preach a punchy message. I've really met a man who was as gifted a communicator preacher as Mike Erie was. And he would go straight down the line. And they were going for this. Because this is a cool, sexy church, they said. We don't want people to come because it's that. We, they want people, they said, to come because of a hard conviction of obedience to the living God, no matter what. The price may be, let's have a perch Sunday. I've never heard that of every church in my whole life. I don't think I've ever, well, maybe I preach that every Sunday, but, but I don't really get that from too many churches. The great fear of God, where we don't fear God, we give ourselves over to evil. Number two, the apostles performed signs and wonders. Now, this is a chunky little verse. It's a beautiful verse. We know that a sign points to something and we know that they are pointing to Jesus. Is that all this passage is saying? No, 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 no. I think there's more. There's the mystery of laying on of hands. Isn't it a mystery? Isn't it an amazing thing? The apostles laid hands on them. You think, well, what is there in this hand? What, 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 what? Is it? No, there's nothing fancy. 
Paul's hand wasn't fancy. He didn't glow when he walked. Peter's hand was the hand of a fisherman, scarred and grained by the, the nets day and night and sea salt, beach soil. But somehow, in the humble act of laying on of hands, the apostles saw the power of God evidenced with signs and wonders. Not just anyone. I don't just let anyone put their hands on me. There's a mystery there. And I don't want their jujus if they got jujus. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, I dig the pure. I, that's what, what I'm after. But I'll tell you what else is interesting for me out of this passage. The apostles performed it. Now, let's look at Jesus. Just follow with me for a moment, if you may. Jesus does something very interesting in Luke's gospel. For those of you a little less acquainted, there are four Jesus stories in our scriptures. And um, in one of them, written by a doctor, Jesus heals people. Well, that's cool. The only problem, there's one of him. So what he does then is he calls 12 others and he says, guys, come, I want you to walk with me. And it said he gave them, this is Luke chapter nine, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, to drive out all de demons and to cure diseases. Who was he telling? 12 dudes. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He said, take nothing with you for your journey, blah, 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 and proclaim the good news, healing people everywhere. Well, the apostles, verse 10, returned. They reported to Jesus what they had done. And it's just like this high five moment of redemptive grandeur. It's a beautiful moment. So now it's Jesus does it. He gets 12 other dudes to do it. And then he does something very peculiar, chapter 10. And after this, Jesus appointed 72 others and he sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest. Go, I'm sending you like lambs amongst the wolves. And he gives them a whole spiel and he talks about the kingdom of God. And um, where am I here? And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I mean, it's a much longer passage, but I want you to get the rhythm of it. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Uh, do not rejoice. So he tells 12 to go. Then he tells 72 to go. Do you see the progressive multiplication? Now let's go to the New Testament. What happens here? Well, Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts is the great story of the early church, about 60 some years. It's an incredible adventure. We marvel. Oh, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. I just remembered. I want one more. Jesus 12, 72. And then in Mark chapter, chapter 16. Sorry, sorry, sorry. A passage that is. People query whether it should be in the Bible or not, but I think to this story, it fits in amazingly. Jesus, right at the end of his life, says this, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all nations. Wherever, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. I think some of you are sitting and saying, Chris, what does this have to do with me? I think it's an invitation to a supernatural life. That's what I think it has to do with you. You see, Christianity as a moral essence is dissatisfying. It leaves us with too many intellectual philosophical questions that are hard to answer. But when I embrace the invitation is not to a higher moral life, but it's an invitation to, to supernatural partnership. He tells 12 guys, then he tells 72, and then he says this at, at the end of his life, and in my name, everyone will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they will place or lay their hands on the sick and they will get well. Do you see the story? The pebble in the pond was Jesus. The pond splashes out to 12. Then it increases to 72. Then it increases to everyone. Let's go back to our passage. What does our passage say? Apostles performed signs and wonders. This is a picture, dear friends, of a very young, immature church. There is this anticipation. Is this going to explode? 
Is something else going to happen here? Because what I see in the life of Jesus is not what Simon Ponsonby calls clericalism, the few who do the everything. This is the many empowered on a great transcendent adventure. You, me, doing incredible things just like this. So chapter five, Acts chapter five. You following? Someone says, when I preach, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. I'm sorry. <laughs> chapter five, Acts chapter five, it says this. The apostles performed many signs and wonders amongst the people. Okay, we got that. That's what Jesus did, but he did more. So let's go to chapter six, turn over the page. Who do we find yet? Stephen's a pretty cool dude. He's full of faith and the Holy Spirit. He's a good guy. He becomes a deacon, a part of the early governmental exploration of the church. No one told them to have deacons. They just had to kind of find their way forward. But he was a man full of grace and power and performed great signs and wonders among the people. Oh, that's what Jesus did. He didn't just start with a few, the 12, because he then took them to the 72. Is that what's gonna happen in the early church? Oh yeah, so this is a deacon guy who now joins this adventure of the impossible and improbable. Chapter eight. Here we find a guy called Philip, an ordinary guy like you and me, and he goes to a place called Samaria and he starts preaching the gospel in verse seven of chapter eight. With shrieks, impure spirits came out of many and many were paralyzed or lame. Sorry, many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Ah, that's what Jesus did. He did it. He gave it to 12 dudes who gave it to 72 who said everyone's gonna do it. Now I get it. The apostles perform signs and wonders. We dig it, but it's not enough. Then it gets added to the deacons, the other kind of leaders in the community. And that's cool. But then he gives it to someone who's not a leader, who's not a deacon in the church, has no office in the church. In fact, Luke as a doctor writes and says, I think he's an evangelist. I think he's someone just like you and, and, and he just loves sharing the gospel and signs and wonders and miracles hit him. The invitation is not to watch the apostles perform. It's to create a hunger in your heart. Could you use someone just like me? But Chris, I have doubts. Yes, sir, you do. So do I. Doubts are a gateway to faith. Next question. Well, well I've, never, I've never prayed for anyone before. Great, tonight we're gonna help you. you you're gonna do it tonight. But what happens if they don't get healed? It doesn't matter. We don't promise healing which I think is part of the tenderness of kingdom now theology, which says God wants everyone healed now. We see that is not the truth. I'm gonna die. So if God wants to heal everyone now, I'm just gonna keep living. That's pretty bizarre. Now we're all gonna die. So God doesn't heal everyone all the time. In fact, Mark's gospel says he healed one, healed a few, healed many, healed everyone. But we don't give up. We do not give up. It's like the tide. And again, dare I remind you, and I'm embarrassed to say, we've been doing this since for 45 years. I started preaching on the street at the age of 18, praying for the sick. <laughs> I've seen God heal people. Not enough. But enough to create a hunger inside of me to see cancers go. Broken limbs healed muscles restored, empty wombs filled. That's the one area that Meryl and I seem to have the most, uh, it's not even success because that implies it has to do with us. But over the years, we've had so many photographs sent over the uh, text to us. Hey, you prayed for us at that conference or that event. Here is the answer to the prayer. We couldn't become pregnant. Tried for eight years. See? The one, the 12, the 72, the everyone, the apostles, the deacons, the existing leadership, Philip, a dude just like us, and one more. You've been so gracious to me. 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, how are we doing time-wise, Dana? Your watch lies. It's actually, it's on speed dial, I think myself. It's like 1.5. 
<laughs> in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there's a beautiful little verse. And the verse says this. In the following directives, Paul, Paul's on the phone to the Corinthian church. And he says, listen, dudes, there's some things here that are not cool. He says, I have no praise for you if your meetings do more harm than good. And then seven things he unpackages that's really unhelpful when they meet together. Thank you, my love. Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But I actually just want to dash to this one. I think the Lord should speak to you, my love. Let's see how much you listen to his voice. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. Now what shall we say, brothers and sisters? 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Now what then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, everyone has. Everyone has a hymn, an organized hymn, and casual, informal, in the moment hymn. Everyone has a word of instruction or something. There is a posture of readiness to instruct, to open up the scriptures, to speak to each other. Him, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Everything must be done that the church will be built up. Now, what am I trying to say here as I drive the point home? This is an invitation to partner in the supernatural. You know why you find it distasteful? If I was you and just listened to sermons every week, I don't know if I would dig it that much. But I want to partner with God, the Holy Spirit. When we had that worship moment, I thought, no, well, we can do the normal thing and end it and say hi to everyone. But I thought, no, hang on. God's brooding here. The Holy Spirit's hovering here. Let's see what he wants to do. Now, that gets me out of bed in the morning. That you're able to think, I'm going to my colleagues today. We're going to sit and have coffee together. And God, the Holy Spirit, is going to speak through you to them. Where was Peter's miracles? In the street. They put the sick there. It wasn't in a sanitized environment. The colonnade could, could, could uh, seat 30 to 50,000 people. It's massive. That's the invitation. You want in? That's what this is about. There is so little, dear friends. There is so little that is as compelling as when God uses you. So little. Because you know it's not you. I was sitting outside, the sun was beautiful, and I was pulling one of our chairs out and uh, reading um, uh, C. Peter Wagner's commentary on Acts. And I just said, oh, Jesus, I'm not up to this task. It hasn't been an easy week for me, to be honest with you. It's complicated, layered, emotional. But... I know you. You can take the weak and the fragile and the uncertain and you can do something extraordinary with them. See, that's the beauty of this gospel. It's not just the grace to receive redemption. It's not just the grace to transform your life. It's the grace to partner with God in this global adventure, seeing lives changed one at a time. When my kids were small, hey dad, how was your, how was your day? It was great. Changing the world one person at a time. Every one of us has a person that can encounter God. You meet God and represent Jesus. These people were in awe of what was going down. Jerusalem was. But it said God added to their number daily. There was this, we'll be petrified. Things happen around you guys. But can we join? What, you want to come and lay down your life and die for a story? For a dead guy? A dead carpenter from Nazareth? Yeah, yeah, that's what I want to do. But I'm petrified. We'll leave it there. That's the invitation. That's the core. That's what makes this Christianity so jolly compelling that God would use someone like you and me. For 40 years, every Sunday, I felt so inadequate. Not when I was young. When I was young, I thought I was amazing. <laughs> but I did. I mean, I sucked, but I thought I was amazing. How could God use you? How could God allow your hands to go onto a sick person or someone who is held captive by an impure spirit? Isn't that an amazing phrase? Impure spirit. It normally implies sexual perversion. Impure. 
something that is twisted, something that God has given that's pure for a husband and a wife gets impured. And we open our, uh, the heart, our heart up to the work of the enemy, to darkness. Please don't think that when you and I sin, there are no consequences. I know that's OC theology, but it's not Bible theology. The grace is there for God as we come to the table. The grace is there for God to cleanse us from all of our sin. The grace is there for the cross to have its work in my life as I wrestle with my rare, with my kind of rank humanity. And it's, oh God, I'm such a freaking sinful person. The thing I want to do, Paul says in Romans, the thing I want to do, I don't do. The things that I want to do, I do. Oh God, help me. And this is an aged apostle who gave us the scriptures. And he said in the climax of his kind of theological ode, he said, oh God, I'm such a sinner. We're in good company. It's not in the realization of our sin, but our ability to repent and acknowledge that I am a sinner. We come to the table in the rhythmic uh, beauty of ritual, coming and breaking the bread and say, oh God, would you forgive me? Would you forgive me? It's the persistence of impurity that opens our hearts up to darkness. I love you. You know that. For seven years, we've loved you. For seven years, I have fought for you, honestly. And this is not a Chris's great moment, forgive me. I've pounded the back bay, sometimes in tears, crying out to God on your behalf, knowing that the world, the devil, and the flesh are running riot with you, trying to create the ungodly as the normal, wondering why you're filled with anxiety and fear and apprehension and reluctance Because the world, the flesh, and the devil. John Mark did such a great series on that. But oh, the joy when my heart repents of sin that so easily destroys. Oh, the laughter that rattles my broken soul when I surrender at the cross my sinfulness once again. Never does he say to me, but I, son, I have seen you there before. You say the same thing. Never will he growl at me, scowl at me, moan at me. Never will he withhold his grace towards me. Never will he do that. Only ever the open hand of grace, the nail-scarred hands, will reach out to my tender soul and gather me to himself and hug me one more time. And he will say over me, as he has said over so many, your sins are forgiven you. Go and sin no more. I want to invite you to the table. It's not a moment of spiritual flippancy. It's a moment of weighted glory where God can exchange the darkness that our sin wraps us with and gives us light, glory, and beauty. You lost your beauty? It's not what people say on your Instagram, I like, I like, I like. Oh, you look so cute in that outfit. No, your glory is a deep inner beauty that resonates when the grace of God comes and pours itself out. Thank you for listening to the Genesis Costa Mesa podcast. To find more information about our community, feel free to visit our website, www.genesiscostamesa.com, or find us on social media at Genesis Costa Mesa.